fifth virtual shadowing session. Tonight's session, we will be discussing the new pandemic and what COVID-19, how it affects enter, how it affects when you enter medicine. Uh, so, okay. Hi, I would like to introduce the virtual shadowing working group. We have Reagan, Cheyenne, Taylor, Rachel, Ani, Miriam, myself, and Dr. Ray Fowler. Oops, sorry. I'm not a very good slide handler here. There we are. And now I would like to discuss some of the upcoming topics. July 7th, we will have tactical medicine and SWAT support. July 14th, we will have medical school clerkship. July 21st is ultrasound and emergency medicine and the future of the study of four-dimensional anatomy. July 28th is open to what you guys would like. So uh, if you guys would have comments, um, whatever you guys would like, we have, um, we could do a lot of safe emergency medicine. Um, so we are letting you guys decide on that one. And August 4th, we have diversity in medicine. And the last uh, upcoming session, we will have pediatrics and pediatric emergency medicine. We will also- All right. Have okay. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. We appreciate it and we're ready to get going. Uh, folks, there will be um, two times to uh, ask questions. Um, one is smack dab in the middle of the session and then the other will be at the uh, end of the session. This is gonna be a long talk. I hope you last through it. There are 721 of you folks out there and we're absolutely delighted. Um, I wanna give you three websites to look at. One is www.emergencymedicine.ws. This is a website we do at UT Southwestern. It has six or seven years of emergency medicine lectures that were done from our residency program and visiting faculty. You are more than welcome. On the 2012 uh, lecture list at the very bottom, you'll get to meet Dr. Bob McClellan. Bob was the third surgeon in the room that took care of Kennedy that day. And I got to know Bob really well. He was a wonderful person, a great surgeon, a truly a world famous surgeon. And one day we just got Bob to do a stand up for us in the EMS division at UT Southwestern. And for an hour, he talked about what happened. For the first half hour, he talks about what happened that day in 1963. And then for the next half hour, he talks about what happened after that. And it's really worth watching. So I would urge you to go out and take a look at it. Another site that you will find great interest in is www.emdocs.net, done in part by one of our faculty at UT Southwestern, Alex Koifman. It is a terrific website to get really current discussions of about anything that you would uh, like to know about emergency medicine. And then finally, I have my own site, rayfowler.com. You can contact me personally through there if you want. I have a number of lectures out there and I've got a number of my writings and a book that I've been working on out there as well. All right, let's get started. Y'all, life is nowhere near as calm as you think that it is. We've got our cell phones, we have a tank full of gas, we have our apartments, we have our conveniences, our luxuries, we've got Netflix, uh, we have pretty much the food on the corner that we want and so we become, we become naturally because this is the nature of humanity as they become more civilized let me rephrase that word civilized as they become more settled uh, civilized i would direct you to the book sapiens by yuval harari in in terms of the history of the human race from the hunter-gatherer period forward every civilization has been civilized but the history of the world folks has been that of plagues that have decimated the populations during the growing populations on the earth as far back as you can look. And folks, listen to me. If you're gonna get into medicine, you gotta understand that what we're seeing with this COVID thing has been the nature of humanity and the nature of the human race ever since we've been around. Moreover, these epidemics have been complicated by the, by, by the fact and the occurrence of war throughout humanity. 
as tragic as it is. Folks, we had two world wars in the last century. I mean, come on. You know, millions and millions of people killed on the battlefield. And in the, in the late teens of the last century, which we'll come to presently, <clears throat> um, you had boats traveling all over the world, taking soldiers here and there around the world and transmitting infection with them. But these infections have also occurred in peace in all populations, of all cultures, of all civilizations, on all continents. And folks, this, this life is not calm. I, I will be... Oh, sorry. Pardon the reach. I've shown you this before. This is, and I'm going to show you at the end of this lecture. It's, um, it is uh, Mike Osterholm's book, The Deadliest Enemy. Mike has been on the news quite a bit. Many of you will seen him. Mike um, uh, is an epidemiologist up in Minnesota. And this book published in 2017 really calls it about what was going to happen. We were unprepared for this epidemic. And I will get into this epidemic a great deal. But, the, but he also writes in his book that these epidemics are still occurring. Malaria is not under control. There is not a malaria vaccine. Tuberculosis is not under control. Uh, Ebola, for, it was announced while I was working on these slides in the last week that it looks like finally the second major outbreak on earth of Ebola has finally come to, come to an end in the Congo, only waiting for the next one. And of course, the other coronavirus, MERS and SARS and Zika. Zika emerged in the last few years. Dengue fever, yellow fever. Yellow fever was endemic in America for many years, spread by mosquitoes. Nipa virus, this is to name but a few. If you look at plague specifically, which is Yersinia pestis, you can look back into the archeological remnants going back for millennia to in fact see how this particular bacteria plague, bubonic plague, Yersinia pestis, has indeed, forgive the pun, plagued mankind going back for thousands of years. The year 541, the first pandemic spreads for hundreds of years from Egypt to the Mediterranean. And then a very important epidemic, which I'll come to in a moment, <clears throat> but the one in 1346, which was the second Yersinia pestis plague that spread from Central uh, uh, Asia all the way to Western Europe that was unparalleled in human history. There are estimates that the plague of 1346, um, 1348 into the 1350s may have killed as much as half of Europe, the Black Death, tw uh, 25 million deaths in Europe alone. These were terrible things. And folks, there were no antibiotics. There, were, there was no uh, Koch germ theory of disease, which came in around 1880, plus or minus. And so thus, uh, they did not know what was happening. Were you not religious enough? Did someone in your family commit a, a terrible sin? Uh, and so forth. And so then the 1860s, the third plague, plague epidemic originating in China, uh, resulting in millions of deaths spreading across, uh, uh, spreading west. Plague cases are massively reduced since during the second half of the 20th century, but they're still occurring. But today, that particular bacteria, <clears throat> excuse me, especially because it's treatable with antibiotics, <clears throat> we see many, many fewer deaths <clears throat> per year. The progress, in quotes, of humanity has been made up of a number of issues. Now, let's talk about colonialism. There is a wonderful book that I have over here that I will not get up to come show you called 1491. Now, let me ask you a question. What happened in 1492? Should we all say it together? Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right? We all remember that. The book is called 1491. And what the book is about is just, well, how large, how extensive was the population of the native natives of the Western continents, which I think is the most politically correct way to say that, the folks who were calling it home the Mayas, the Inca, Incas, and so forth. Was it just a few folks living in teepees here and there? No, there were hundreds of millions of people occupying the Western Hemisphere. And when, <clears throat> who were not at all immune to disease, diseases that had become endemic in, the, in, the, uh, in Europe. And we will come back to the word endemic presently. <clears throat> and so what happened then with the, discovery of the Western Hemisphere by European uh, uh, colonialists that indeed massive disease slaughter occurred on an enormous continental scale. For example, <clears throat> when the pilgrims, 
um, landed around the 1600s uh, in the northeastern uh, uh, part of in the part of the northeastern United States. Uh, they were received and more or less looked at kind of skeptically by, in part, the Delaware uh, tribe, the Delaware Indians, we call them, the natives of that area that we call the Delawares. Um, and in fact, a year later, when uh, the anecdotal history uh, of, of, when the anecdotal history of um, the Thanksgiving occurred, there were a few of the native uh, natives there of the Delawares that were present, but 95% of the native population had died within that year due to diseases transmitted by the colonials. That is the nature of the progress of humanity that is in fact what has happened when diseases are endemic one e in one area and there is no immunity in an area. Sanitation has made an enormous impact I was reading today, preparing for this talk, for example, <clears throat> about pictures of some of the various great cities across America, excuse me, I beg your pardon, across Europe. And in fact, when it was the norm of those days to pump sewage into the great rivers of those cities about how gradually containment occurred. Well, as we all know, infectious bacteria, such as cholera, and, uh, which is a bacteria and viruses, <clears throat> are indeed present in sewage and so it was not until enormous measures began to occur in populations that were living close to each other in large cities that uh, such as sewers and waste management began to occur and then with the occurrence of the availability of clean water <clears throat> the, but there was no germ theory folks we didn't know what caused no the, the people of the days did not know what caused these infections and indeed, it wasn't until the landmark work of Koch in the, around the 1880s um, that it began to be understood that you could find an organism, extrapolate it from someone with a disease or extricate it, and then you could then put it into another individual who was susceptible to then create that disease and thus gave rise to the germ theory. It wasn't too long before that that Edward Jenner <laughs> noticed a, and of course, one of the horrible, terrible scourges of mankind was smallpox that goes back into history as far back as you can find recorded history. And that Jenner noted that, that in the population of individuals that he met, that there were milk women, milkmaids, <clears throat> who did not have the deep scars of smallpox. And he got to thinking, what was that about? And so he got the idea of, uh, of taking some of the um, juice out of the lesion of someone with cowpox, which was a milder disease, and inoculating with that, and indeed was able to uh, and create a, a a preventative for smallpox. Smallpox being called vaccinia, and thus the term vaccination comes from that of vaccinia. Now, what you may not know is the fact that actually go, going back to the Chinese over a thousand years ago, I, I found data going back into the something around 700 AD of this, of this uh, millennia, uh, that uh, actually uh, inoculating people with scabs of smallpox had been done. And if it didn't kill you, which it could, the estimates were smallpox typically with a mortality approaching 70%, that if you took a dried scab, which would have the attenuated, which means dried out virus in it, that in fact the mortality rate might be five or 10 or 15%, but it wouldn't be 70%, and then immunity would be gained. Crowding remains a social challenge. It's interesting to read about Thomas Jefferson as president, who had a very, uh, he was a nature guy himself, and he had a, a very great feeling, the fact that cities had sprung up with too dense a population, and in fact, um, were causing people to live closer together in poor conditions, poor sanitation, and thus being quite prone to epidemics running rampant through their communities. And then finally, international travel, dating back to Leif Erikson back a thousand years ago, or coming forward all the way to today where you can book a flight to anywhere and be able to be there in a matter of a few hours. The international travel has indeed allowed infections to spread quickly all over the world as was manifest most recently by the COVID outbreak, mm -hmm. which we will talk about extensively. Um, uh, Ilana, you still there? 
I'm just checking about audio. Everything okay? And if, if there's a problem with audio, please speak up. I see that my mic is working. So somebody speak up if there's a problem. Um, I'd like to tell you now about someone that I really admire. Um, there are two factors of greatness in medicine that I will say to you, the folks, the 742 of you that are on our session tonight, um, about you pre-med folks. You have to be a really bright person and you cannot be a jerk. Now, what do I mean? You have to have the work ethic and the smarts, the aptitude, but you also have the, you have to have the ability to communicate. Ignaz Semmelweis is an interesting story. This is a, a guy who, who was living in the era of the uh, 1840s in Europe where there was an epidemic of what was called child bed fever, uh, also known as the puerperal sepsis. The puerperium is the period, uh, the first few weeks after delivering a child that a woman has after going into labor and delivering a child, the puerperium. We don't use that word much anymore. Um, <clears throat> and there were hospitals for women to come and lie in when they were in labor and deliver their babies. They were called the lying in hospitals of Europe. Uh, many in France, many in Austria. And in the 1840s, there was a horrible epidemic of women coming into lying in hospitals, going into labor and dying of what was called puerperal sepsis or childbed fever, which is today we call septic endometritis. Their wombs would get infected, filled with pus, and in a horrible, miserable, high fever, delirious, terribly agonizing way, they would die these miserable deaths. Semmelweis was this young ob doc in Vienna. He was from Budapest, but working in Vienna uh, at, one of the, at, one, at two of the lying-in hospitals in Vienna. And Semmelweis saw all this death occurring around him, and he was horrified. And Semmelweis was a very bright man. He was working in two hospitals. One, the medical school, had seven wards. And Semmelweis, as a young assistant professor, um, worked in one of these wards as the boss on that ward as an OB-GYN doc, gynecologist obstetrician. And he saw that when a woman was unfortunate to die of childbed fever, unfortunate enough to die of childbed fever, in the medical school, then the attending physician who was unfortunate enough to lose his patient would have to take the patient, take them to the pathology lab and cut them open and reach in and determine why the patient died. And then, I hope you can see this okay, I'm gonna adjust my screen just a little, and then they would wipe their hands to wipe the pus off on their coats like this. And the doctors who were the most experienced were obviously the ones with the thickest stripes of goo on their coats. This is not a myth, this is true. This was before, this was 40 years before the germ theory of disease. And then they would go back to clinic and examine their patients. Semmelweis saw this. Semmelweis also saw that in the other hospital, the smaller lying in hospital that was run by nuns who were very fastidious, uh, fastidious the death rate was almost zero, approaching 30 to 50% death rate in the medical school and almost zero in the other. And Semmelweis saw this, including the traffic back and forth from the pathology lab where the dissections were done back to the clinic. So Semmelweis, this ball-headed jerk, <clears throat> said this, on my ward, you will disinfect your hands with chlorate of lime. Today we know chlorate of lime, which was uh, calcium hypochlorite. Today we know that as sodium hypochlorite, which is bleach. He said, you will bleach your hands before you touch my patient. And that's what he did. And here's what happened. This is the death rate that was occurring in the hospital like this in these awful epidemics. And you can see this terrible epidemic that was occurring here. And then Semmelweis says, you will wash your hands. Death rate goes to near zero. He discovered that there were some who were not washing their hands and the death rate went back up. And then so he cracked down in, into 1848 his death rate went virtually to zero on his wards. He collected his data. 
he wrote it up. He published a textbook. I actually have that book. It's, it's on the etiology of childbed fever. I actually have it here. And unfortunately, he was a jerk. And he lorded his data and his success about chilling the death rate over the other physicians and faculty members there. And so doing what medical school faculty did in those days, they fired him. They politely, they did not renew his contract. And you can see that when he left and took his bleach with him, that the death rate went back up again. Semmelweis was not hireable. Uh, he lost his mind. He, went, he returned home to Budapest, to Buda, whereupon he lost his mind. He was locked away in an insane asylum. And in 1864, he was beaten by a guard and died in 10 days of a head injury. The same year that Pasteur did his work for sterilization, the same year that a few years before uh, Lister did his work on sterilizing surgical instruments, and just about 15 years before uh, Koch discovered the germ theory of disease. Semmelweis was a genius, he was bright, he had aptitude, and he could not communicate. He was doing the right thing, unfortunately, for an insufficient, incomplete reason. You, ladies and gentlemen, learn this from Ignat Semmelweis, that as we enter medicine, we're doing it for the reason, which is to learn the applied science, to enter into a partnership for healthcare, to improve the human condition. That's what matters. And our ability as scholars and as perpetual students to be able to communicate is essential. Because when we look around us, we are humans are surrounded by all the things of the forests and all the beasts of the, of the forests and the trees and the hills. And from thence and all of those, there are infections, whether they are viruses or protozoans, or bacteria that have been and can be acquired and will continue to be acquired. <clears throat> the history of disease, you might say, is um, something that has had odd effects here and there. For example, it was in 1665 that the Great Plague of London, which was typhus, I believe, it was not bubonic plague, um, caught, and of course, the very densely packed million people uh, living in London at the time, caused people of means who could to leave for the country. One of those was 22 year old um, Isaac Newton who went to the country, uh, to a family's uh, uh, estate in the country. As a, uh, he was not yet the well-known, well-published, worldwide um, honored genius at that time, where he went to the country and sat out you know, in nature for several years, it was about two years actually, waiting for things to calm down so he could head back to school. And it was during that time, for example, that is said that he happened to be looking up and saw the apple fall from the tree. That is said to be an apocryphal story that probably really didn't happen that way, but it was during that period that Newton took his, fr his, his first run at the laws of gravitation while the epidemic was burning its way through London. But it was also during that period as well where Newton created this thing that I know that has given many of you hives and rashes low these many years, which is um, uh, Newton invented calculus. It was invented jointly with another mathematician. Uh, but so the very calculus that you have worked on and sweated bullets over was actually directly related. It happened in part because of a great plague that occurred in humanity. Let's move forward to 102 years ago. The great influenza pandemic of 1918 uh, started actually in the summer, probably in America and probably in Kansas, though it was given the name the Spanish flu. And the reason it was given that name, Spanish flu, was that the, Sp the Spanish, right at the tail end of World War I, were the only ones that were consistently reporting their epidemiological data that actually revealing the impact of this growing, mounting, horrible epidemic on, um, on their country. And so thus the, the name came and it stuck called the Spanish uh, flu. What seemed to happen, it occurred simultaneously with the tail end of a world war, especially as ships full of returning soldiers who were so grateful to come home came back home to their countries, including America, bringing the disease with them and in transmitting 
the disease around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, probably 100 million people died worldwide. Uh, here is an example of, we smile at this today, but folks, this is precisely what the COVID shelter on April the 1st, we were setting up at the convention center here in downtown Dallas would have looked like. Uh, because all they had to stop infection in 1918 was masks, distancing, and hand washing. What do we have today, 102 years later, ladies and gentlemen, to stop the infection, to stop COVID? Masks, distancing, and hand washing. Isn't that interesting? We'll come to that more in a moment. Influenza is one of the most notorious bugs in the hit, perhaps the most notorious in the history of the human race, certainly in the top 10, with smallpox and with plague and typhoid and uh, cholera and many others. Uh, it is an RNA virus. Um, it has spikes on its surface called neuraminidase and hemagglutinin, and it is by these spikes, the various types of these spikes, which in and which H that the viruses are named. Now, what is interesting, and if you will look at the book, which I will recommend to you and then recommend again, which is The Great Influenza by John Barry, which if you've got the summer off, go get it. It's a terrific read. He's a really good writer about what happened in 1918. He writes in there in one of his later editions of the book about various viral particles can get into the body, whereupon within the nuclear, uh, within the nucleus, or in the cytosol for that matter, they can recombine. And so in something, age something can recombine and form a new mutation. This is true and this is known, and this is the nature of influenza. The influenza virus of 1918, whether it's the Spanish flu or whatever you call it, was a horrible infection. And when this is an example of a biopsy of a lung cell, of a lung, a pulmonary uh, uh, biopsy. And what ends up happening, these are air sacs here, and the air sacs are full of what this would be is pus, and what this is, would be is uh, blood. These are red blood cells. Uh, these are immune cells, whether they are macrophages or lymphocytes, more likely lymphocytes from this part. And we'll show you a lot more of that in just a moment. And <clears throat> this disease caused a rapid onset hemorrhagic bleeding pneumonitis, lung inflammation, that caused people within hours, especially the young and the healthy, to die drowning in their own blood. Guess what that was called? It was called a cytokine storm, the very same thing that many of you have been hearing about this COVID outbreak as well. Look at this, folks, and put this now in perspective of where we're going with this talk about COVID. In the pandemic of 1918, there were 1.8 billion souls on Earth. Approximately 100 million people died of the Spanish flu. 100 million divided by 1.8 billion is five, about 6%. 6% of the population of the world died of the Spanish flu. It was horrible. It was said that bodies choked the Ganges River in India. Today, with 7.8 billion souls on earth, a similar calamity to this would kill almost a half billion people. We haven't gotten anywhere near this with COVID. Thank God so far. So now let's go on to COVID. Here, here is a, an artist's rendering of the virus. You can see what you see. The, the operative issue are what is called spike proteins on the surface. Please focus on this triangle right here, all of you. It is through this triangle that the virus makes connection with the uh, ACE2 receptor on the um, uh, surface of what is mostly the nasopharynx and principally the nasal mucosa. This triangle plugs into the nasal mucosa mostly. It is through this triangle that the problem we have right now with this growing epidemic that we're going to talk about quite a bit more is coming on. We have to keep this triangle out of the noses of people. It's a coronavirus. It's one of the most common cold viruses. And as with flu virus, it mutates. 
it enters the body through the ACE2 uh, uh, angiotensin uh, receptor 2, uh, uh, principally in the nose and pharynx. It, it appears then to spread throughout the body, sparing no organ system focus. This is not obvious to everyone, especially a lot of the students and residents that I work with. They keep looking for somebody with a freaking sore throat and a fever. Folks, it may be diarrhea. It may be just muscle aches. It may be acute renal failure that you really can't see at the bedside, and they may not have a fever at the moment. The family of these viruses belonging to the coronaviridae mainly consist of virulent pathogens that have a zoonotic property, meaning they come from animals, such as SARS, the original SARS, MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, and of this family have emerged before, and now the novel COVID has emerged apparently from China and spread worldwide. Folks, here's a picture of what the virus looks like. If you hadn't seen it before, here it is, all 734 of you. So let's see what we see. What you can see along here, what I want to do is, these are the actual encoded proteins. See what my cursor is doing? So it ain't a whole bunch, is it? This is a tiny little thing, barely a few microns in size. And these here things are coding for these here proteins. Here are the actual three-dimensional structures of the proteins that are causing the misery that's going on right now. Let's look at a couple of them. For example, helicase, this is involved with reassembling the virus uh, once that it is, um, once its guts are re-manufactured uh, mm, inside. Well, I guess you're stuck with me. Uh, could you mute everybody, um, uh, and then I will unmute myself, please, Reagan. Okay, I, there we go. Sorry about that. We're just we're trying to keep uh, everybody everybody listening, and we are, by the way, 40 minutes into what's probably going to go another 30 or 45, just to let you know. But the critical one. And look at this three-dimensional structure right here. The, the treatment that we're very, uh, treatments that we're very interested in that we'll come to momentarily are directed toward this structure that you see here. Namely, the virus through this here tells the cell to make more of itself. Remdesivir blocks right here and stops the cell, the human cell, from manufacturing more of the viral DNA. So this is what happens. Here is a viral particle. Here are these spike proteins. And here is the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor that is right here, ACE2 we'll now call it. In this case, we'll say that this is in the nose, right, where you put your finger where it itches or, or you don't. This spike protein comes and plugs in right there. It is a it, it is a mutated emerged fit that apparently is why it took so long for this virus to show up that ultimately the mutation had to emerge such that, that th this thing fitting here was sufficient to cause the virus to be able to get through the cell membrane and actually to be able to get into the cells surrounded by an endosome here that has a certain pH uh, acid concentration inside here that then causes the various tissues of the cells to become infected. There is at least one additional receptor. We won't go into that right now. And then viral particles can also then ultimately be shed when manufactured. All right, so what is this, the disease, the, the disease COVID? It's pulmonary, which is lungs. It's cardiac, it's renal, it's gastrointestinal, it's neurological, it's hematological. It's dermatological. It is a broad system disease. And if you will download the slide set, you'll be able to get in here to get talk, you'll get into this article, which I strongly recommend, about how does coronavirus kill clinicians uh, in terms of its ferocious rampage through the body. This picture came from that article. I would commend it to your reading. So here, for example, is an artist's cross section of the lungs where normal endothelium of the lungs that pours open and blood pour, this, this is a blood cell, pours into the lungs. Inflammatory cells migrate into the lungs. Mucus is secreted into the lungs, causing the air sacs to no, no longer be able to transmit oxygen across the alveolar capillary membrane. The liver can be involved in up to half of hospitalized uh, patients. 
The kidneys can be involved, indeed causing acute renal failure. The intestines can become involved. There are ACE2 receptors inside the kidneys. At least 20% of patients may have diarrhea. Encephalitis can occur, causing mental confusion. Uh, we've seen the conjunctivitis, the pink eye that can occur. The nose, of course, is where virtually, mostly, the predominant amount, forgive, I'm sorry, I'm stammering, the predominant amount of the infection appears to enter through the nose. Ladies and gentlemen, look at me. Do not let stuff get in your nose. Now, I know that sounds stupid, but what I'm telling you is that the, the, this is only a six-month-old disease, and PPE, personal protective equipment, works. Why? Because it keeps respiratory droplets out of here. Don't let stuff in here. Why? Because you may get sick, you may make your spouse or family member sick, and you could cause the death of one of your loved ones. So keep stuff out of your nose, wear your damn mask. Sorry, apologize. Uh, it can also get in through the eyes, through the mucous membranes. Some patients lose their sense of smell, a term called anosmia. Uh, scientists speculate that the virus actually moves up the nerve endings, what are called the, out to the olfactory neurons, uh, which are actually at the base of the brain, which is the first cranial nerve. And finally, a very important critical part is the heart and blood vessels. Indeed, a myocarditis can occur. What appears to be evident is this picture, ladies and gentlemen. I know we've been on the slide a long time, but please look right here. This is called the endothelium. These cells here, here, here are the cells that line the blood vessels. It appears that there are three things COVID does, one of which is that it attacks these cells called the endothelial cells. The blood vessels, of course, line every organ in the body. And when you mess up the lining of the blood vessels, it messes up every organ in the body. This is what we've learned about COVID. It jacks with the blood vessels, so therefore that's why it messes with all the organs. And, I, and let me come back to this to say that we see uh, acute viral myocarditis, which is a heart muscle inflammation that mimics a heart attack and can be quite serious. So let's talk about the lung disease itself. This is a three-dimensional uh, computed tomography, CAT scan of the lungs of a patient infected with COVID. And what I wanna show you here is, this is the right lung, because you're looking at them face on. This is the left lung. Notice the right lung is a bit larger than the left lung. Um, uh, the pulmonary tract comes down from the trachea through here, dividing into the various primary, secondary, and tertiary bronchi that ultimately go out into the periphery of the lung tissue. This green stuff on this three-dimensional CD does not belong. This is airways, <clears throat> excuse me, let me rephrase, small airways and alveoli, which are air sacs, full of pus and inflammatory cells, pus and inflammatory cells, pus and inflammatory cells. <clears throat> Those cells do not function. They allow bacteria also to cross the alveolar capillary membrane, what's left of it, causing sepsis, and ultimately causes lower and lower oxygen levels, ultimately resulting in the patient smothering uh, to death, requ requiring ventilation. We'll talk about that uh, significantly. I have got something on my slide. Would y'all take a breath for a second? I don't, what, it, what is that? Am I doing that? What is that? Reagan, do you have any idea what that is? I don't know. I think is. you drew on the slide on accident. Uh, well, how do I get it off? I have no clue. Well, right, uh, somebody asked Rachel. She knows everything. And uh, if y'all figure it out, let's see. Paul, share, annotate. Maybe it's de annotate. Uh, you would go to annotate, and there should be an eraser where you can hover over. Perfect. How cool is that? See, even old men can learn things. All right, let's go back to this thing. Thank you, Rachel. And just speak up anytime. Um, or whoever it was that said that. Let me go back to my slide. Let me, how do I get out of the eraser? Okay. Um, you know, I, I can't get make my slide work now. Now what do I do? You go back and click on the mouse part under the annotate. It's right next to text. There you go. I'm sorry that I don't know these things, everybody. All right. So, all right, you folks, all 732 of you. What we're about to talk about is how to read a chest x-ray. Some of you already know this, most of you don't, so we're gonna talk about this. I know you don't need to know it yet, but this is the old man here. This is old doc, you're shadowing me this evening, so I'm gonna tell you how I do stuff. This is how I read a chest x-ray. Let me pause for some water. <clears throat> Thank you. 
this is a chest x-ray. Uh, I don't use a lot of mnemonics. It actually looks like mnemonic, right? You know that, uh, you know that word. Mnemonic is basically where a word is used to mean each letter means something. But I do for chest x-rays. I also do for abdomen x-rays. And for chest x-rays, I use the word chest. C is for cavity. Here is the lung cavity. And these look like they're supposed to look. You have a little stuff at the pulmonary hilum getting progressively less until the finally the outer third pretty much of the lungs have no markings at all. Um, then the heart and the mediastinum. The heart is here. It should be less than one third, excuse me, uh, less than a half the transverse diameter of the chest, which it is. And then this is the mediastinum here. Uh, e is for the edges. We're looking at the edges of the film all the way down here into the uh, thoracic uh, wall to the uh, diaphragmatic, uh, the angle of the diaphragm here, the angle of the diaphragm here. You should have nice sharp angles. This is the diaphragm. Take a deep breath, everybody, right now. When you do this, the diaphragm flattens down almost to the rib margin. Now breathe out. And when you do that, the diaphragm rises almost to the nipple line here. Do it again. Take a deep breath. Diaphragm moves down, breathe out, diaphragm moves back up to here. That's called diaphragmatic excursion. Uh, S is for the soft tissue, and T is for the bony thorax, the bones of the chest. So let's, using this, let's look at a COVID lung x-ray. Now, look for C, look at the cavities first, back and forth for five seconds. And now we're gonna go back to that previous x-ray. Look at these cavities, see what you see. Notice that there are no markings in the peripheral third, a nice good sharp uh, uh, diaphragmatic angle here. Now go here. So what all do you see? That lateral third has lots of stuff that doesn't belong there. None of that stuff should be there. That is all pus and edema uh, sitting in these air sacs in the peripheral part of this lung. This is an old person. This person's spine, for example, has all these osteophytes. So this is an older person. We know that older folks are at risk. In looking at the heart, we see the heart shadow is enlarged. And this is because this is an anteroposterior picture. This is taken from the front of the patient rather than from the uh, back of the patient as an x-ray is typically done. What else do we see? We see that this patient, um, I'm gonna get out of that little, yeah, there we are. We see that this patient is having a bad day. Somebody speak up, I'll give you 10 seconds to speak up. What is that right there? Somebody. Uh, an intra -tube. Intra -tube. There you go, that's a good one. I heard Brandon speak up too, that's right. This guy's having a bad day. This is an intratracheal tube. This patient in respiratory failure is on a ventilator in an ICU sick as a moose. These are the um, EKG. Um, uh, these are the EKG leads here, and this is a central venous catheter going into the patient's uh, central circulation. That is there, obviously, to offer the patient's antibiotics and other things. So this is what a critically ill COVID patient. So let's use the mnemonic again. The cavities show a lot of congestion throughout the lung, uh, with without normal pulmonary markings. The heart shadow seems a little bit enlarged. The mediastinum shows an endotracheal tube that is in the trachea. We see a central venous catheter going into the central circulation, which goes all the way down into the right atrium, not quite down into the right atrium. Um, the edges of the film, we have a hard time seeing the diaphragmatic uh, angle here. Uh, the soft tissue is, there's not much to remark, and the, uh, the bony thorax shows a lot of uh, old uh, changes, uh, old changes in, uh, in, the, uh, in the bones of the vertebra. So, folks, we're now about to get pretty technical. Uh, we're going to stop for questions in about eight or nine minutes. Um, I'm going to now start sharing with you some direct stuff that I have just gotten uh, from some what I think are world class um, researchers and clinicians around the country, around the world, looking at how do we treat COVID today, on this day, Tuesday. Um, in June 2020. This is not the acute respiratory distress syndrome. The initial pulmonary phase neither looks like or smells like ARDS, where you have uh, swelling of the pulmonary tissue. 
these ground glass infiltrates, I'll go back to this, that's the ground glass look, uh, are peripheral and patchy and do not resemble the dependent airspace consolidation seen typically with ARDS. Again, that's the respiratory failure syndrome. Extravascular lung water is normal or only slightly increased. This by definition excludes the acute respiratory distress syndrome where the lung is full of water. And so lung compliance, which means you can bag the patient in someone with COVID pneumonia or COVID pneumonitis, unlike ARDS, uh, patients don't respond to positive end expiratory airway pressure. And so treating patients as if they have ARDS is a very dangerous approach. The low oxygen levels, hypoxia, is due to severe ventilation perfusion mismatch, likely due to the microvascular narrowing, the blood clots that are in the lungs, and the, and the damage vasoplegia to the blood vessels. Interestingly, the combination of steroids and ascorbic acid, vitamin C, is essential. Both have synergistic anti-inflammatory actions. You may have noticed, and I hope you are paying attention to this, that the number of people dying of COVID is going down. We were losing 2,000 plus Americans a day dying in America two months ago. That number is more like about 600 Americans dying. So we're getting better at treating the disease, or it may be people getting infected or getting less sick with it, or both. Vitamin C is not just some vitamin that makes you feel better, folks. It protects the endothelium, the lining of the blood vessels from this injury from the virus. Remember, we talked about the blood vessels, about the lining of blood vessels being damaged. Moreover, the vitamin C increases the expression of an interferon alpha, while steroids decrease the expression of the interferon alpha. It should, however, be noted that when steroids are used in the pulmonary phase, which I will show you in a moment, and not in the viral replicative phase, they do not appear to increase viral shedding. Typically, we think if you give steroids, like what you saw in the news, dexamethasone to people, that they start shedding virus more. That when you take someone critically ill on a ventilator and give them steroids then, it does not appear that it makes the infection worse. <clears throat> there are, th now, I know you're tired. I've been talking a lot. I've been going almost an hour. This is one, one of the two or three most important slides in the entire session. Please read this. I'm, I want you to read what is bolded on number one, number two, and number three. Here is the problem with the disease. This disease somehow stimulates the immune system, causing a hyperinflammation resulting in a storm of chemicals that are bad for various tissues called the cytokines. <coughs> Excuse me, this is a dysregulated, a dysfunctional immune system. And the cells infiltrate <coughs> and damage multiple organs, the lungs, kidneys, and heart, as we mentioned, causing aberrant T sites and macrophage activation. I'm so sorry. <coughs> I'm sorry. Look at number two, this is important. COVID does something we didn't expect. It causes the blood to clot. We don't exactly know what that's about. It probably has something to do, at least with the damage occurring to blood vessels. However, this dysregulated immune system damages the endothelium and activates blood clotting. It happens in all the organs. The clotting of the blood happening in the lungs likely has a lot to do with the damage occurring when in the lungs. Folks, your blood is not supposed to be clotting unless you have an injury somewhere so your blood does clot. And when you have <clears throat> thousands of tiny microemboli clogging up the blood vessels of the lungs, that causes a terrible injury to lungs. And then resulting, number three, in severe hypoxia, which is low blood oxygen levels, lung inflammation caused by these cytokines, <clears throat> together with these clots in the lung circulation severely impair, impairs oxygen circulation. The virus or its activation of the immune system or both also infects other tissues. Here is an MRI scan of the brain showing these are inflammations in the brain that should not be there. This should not be there. And this is where COVID virus itself has caused infections in brain tissue. This is an encephalitis. Here is a slice that's right toward the top of, uh, of your nose. 
I'm referring to right, right between your eyes right here, if you can see what I'm doing. <clears throat> From your nose, the olfactory neurons go up to right here. And so this is about where the <clears throat> virus is infecting the olfactory neurons of the brain, resulting in the loss of sense of smell. <clears throat> We're about ready to pause for questions. Recent research and treatment, Remdesivir is an antiviral drug that was first developed. It actually was developed before this. Um, what I was going to say was it was developed and used in the Ebola uh, epidemic and did not appear to have much effect in the Ebola outbreak. There are now antivirals that are effective for Ebola, and there is a vaccine that is very effective for Ebola. I don't know if you knew that. Remdesivir has been tested in a small study on critically ill patients and it shortened the time to recovery with real numbers, and it was impressive. Remdesivir, hundreds of thousands of doses have now been um, dips, distributed all over the country at uh, about $2,000 per treatment, which is not terrible given what it costs per day to being in an ICU. Um, and so remdesivir, uh, I'll come back to what it does in a minute. Vaccines are in initial tests only. I'm saying this for the first time it is not at all clear that we will get a vaccine against the coronavirus. There really has not been a history in humans of having a successful vaccine against coronaviruses. We may, but don't count on it. Hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, interestingly, don't appear to be effective. Thamotidine, which is Pepsid, yes, that's an antihistamine type stomach drug, appears to um, uh, inhibit viral um, uh, viral replication. Zinc, I'll come to in a moment, as appears to uh, lower the risk of the cytokine storm. And then the vaccines, we just don't know. And we'll come to the use of other vaccines in just a moment. Here is remdesivir. Here is the molecule. It is a viral RNA polymerase inhibitor. I showed you that three-dimensional picture about where remdesivir actually has its effect. It is only given for IV administration. There is not a pill yet, and thus it is only on hospitalized patients who are critically ill. Now, having said that, this week it was announced that remdesivir could potentially be used as an inhaler, like an asthma-type inhaler, which may be able to be, allow it to be used potentially even as an outpatient. Folks, your old man here was working in the early 1980s in Douglasville, Georgia, uh, in a small ER there when this thing showed up in young men predominantly who came in horribly short of breath, covered with sores. We didn't know what it was. They went on quickly to die. Then the virus HTLV3 uh, was discovered uh, on to be renamed as human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, by the same Dr. Fauci who is on the headlines today. Um, and it wasn't until the late 80s that AZT showed up as an antiviral in which we had any treatment at all. It was not a vaccine, nor is it a vaccine for HIV that gives us hope today that you can actually live a normal life. It is the antivirals, including uh, antivirals and protease inhibitors uh, for HIV that lets people indeed live essentially a normal life if they'll take their medications. Remdesivir is the first drug to give us real hope the fact that we have an antiviral that looks like it can be effective, there's more work yet to be done. Now, I'm about to get into a very technical thing here, and I'm going to challenge all 726 of you to see if you can stay awake during this, because the slides I'm going to show you are stuff that if you get into medical school, you're going to be seeing this in immunology in your first year. I'm going to tell you about the inhibition of bruton tyrosine kinase in patients with severe COVID-19 because this is a very hopeful article. Bruton was Ogden Bruton, who I believe was at, in Baltimore. He was a pediatrician, critical care pediatrician intensivist, who uh, in the mid-century, last century, discovered the disease, pediatric agammaglobulinemia, and was the first to actually treat um, uh, kids uh, with gamma globulin and actually be able to have a treatment and a cure for, or at least a treatment for a gamma globulinemia. Um, the, the, this is what I wanted to show you. This is a cell. This is what kills you due to COVID, the cytokine storm through these various interleukin activations. 
attention to interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor alpha. Bruton tyrosine kinase is an enzyme that activates NF-kappa B. Why am I talking to you about this? Because when I started medical school in 73, the trilaminar cell membrane had just been described. We didn't know of cell proteins, you know, from, you know, Katie's hat band. Now, in these ensuing 40 years, ladies and gentlemen, we know these cellular processes. Well, why do I tell you this? Because these issues right here are right in front of you right now because of this epidemic. And it is this activation here that is killing people in America. This particular article talks about acalabrutinib, which is an immunotherapy, which blocks the activation of bruton tyrosine kinase here, which prevents the activation of NF-kappa B, which prevents the stimulation of, among other things, uh, IL-6, which prevents the cytokine storm. What does it do? The remdesivir causes our cells to stop making so much virus. The acalabrutinib is a drug that keeps the body from turning against itself. Um, C-reactive protein is an annular protein found in blood and plasma. Uh, comes from the liver. It's an acute phase protein that increases following the interleukin-6 secretion. And its physical role is to bind a certain chemical expressed on the surface of, of dead and dying cells. It looks like that. It's a pentamer. Uh, a calabrutinib, <clears throat> um, patients with COVID have a hyperinflammatory response. The BTK enzyme regulates these inflammatory cells activation. This drug was administered off-label to these patients and over a 10 to 14 day treatment that was associated with improved oxygenation in a majority of the patients. The measures of inflammation, the C-reactive protein and the interleukin-6, I know you're tired now, we've been going an hour, normalized quickly, focus, take a deep breath, read this sentence. With the use of this drug and immunotherapy, the C-reactive protein indicating that the body was creating this inflammatory protein and, term and turned against itself, normalized quickly in most patients, as did lymphopenia, which we'll come back to presently. Um, and all this said is the same thing I just told you, which is the fact that, uh, the, that uh, several of the patients were discharged on, on room air. They found here that, uh, that in, the, in the absence of the drug, that these bad chemicals showed up. And so that targeting this BTK was a good thing to do. And the good news, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pill. You can swallow it. The good news, it's already on the market. It's an immunotherapy for a certain kind of lymphoma. And the good news is that you can buy your own bottle full for a mere $15,000 for 60 pills. See right here? But it actually, you know, it, and we, it wouldn't be 60 pills probably. It would be probably more like 14, so what a deal. But it actually, this drug is actually already manufactured and already available by AstraZeneca, and large trials are already underway. Please just look at this. <clears throat> this is the C-reactive protein that was go going up, indication of inflammation. This was the body's lymphocytes going down. The acalabrutinib was started and the lymphocytes, the body's own immune cells went back up and the body's signs of inflammation went back down. Didn't happen on everybody. You can see, for example, on this patient here, that the patient didn't even make it to a ventilator, he died. And this patient, even though he got the drug, had to go on a ventilator and still remain quite sick. But most of these patients normalized their blood counts. So it looks like this drug can really work. This disease is everywhere. This is today. 10 and a half million cases identified. These are the positive tests worldwide with a half million deaths. These are the uh, numbers in the United States today with 2.6 million cases identified in the United States with about 130,000 Americans have died in about four and a half months. Ladies and gentlemen, in four and a half months, we've had the deaths from a new disease occur in this country that killed more Americans than the Korean conflict and the Vietnam War put together almost by nearly a factor of two. Um, Heart disease is the biggest killer of Americans, approaching over 400,000 cases a year. 
at the rate this is going, COVID may exceed heart disease as the largest killer of Americans. These are people that did not have to die. They did not have this disease before they caught it from somebody. And here's the deal. These were US daily deaths. Notice it was up in the 2000 range. Now our US daily deaths now are in the range of about 650. And if we will wear our masks, that the number of deaths are predicted to go down, down. The disease will continue to spread, but the deaths will go down. If we ease and don't wear our masks, the death rate will continue to go up. We must wear our masks ourselves and spread the word. As of today, we've had 2,393 fatalities in our state of Texas here at 148,000 cases. Will this, as we get ready to pause, will this disease become endemic? Meaning a disease regularly found among a particular people in a certain area, perhaps in the entire world, like HIV, like hepatitis B, like hepatitis C, like pneumococcal pneumonia? Will COVID settle in and become and a permanent infection. There seems to be some evidence that old vaccines may stimulate the immune system. Indeed, BCG, Bacillus, Calmet, Gurin vaccine, uh, indeed may stimulate the immune system in a non-specific way that might give a period of several weeks or months of protection. There is lower incidence of COVID in countries that use BCG vaccine routinely. And I'm sorry, this slide, I beg your pardon, excuse, please excuse, please excuse. Oral polio virus, is, appears to be, it is a proven safe and inexpensive vaccine. And there seems to be evidence that taking polio virus vaccine may non-specifically stimulate the immune system to help decrease COVID infections. And so increasing innate immunity, in fact, can reduce the incidence of infection so that vaccinated people have healthier cells that can help fight the infection from all the various cells that are members of the immune system of the body. So the BCG vaccine, uh, which is given to try to prevent tuberculosis, uh, it doesn't routinely protect in everybody, in fact can prevent the spreading, the spreading of blood cell of, uh, of COVID infection, spreading, preventing the spread of COVID infection through improving the strength of the immune system through what is called train immunity through various parts of the immune system in pictures that you see here. In a disturbing parallel to HIV, the coronavirus appears to cause a depletion of important immune cells, which is very interesting, is that it, um, there seems to be an increase in the levels of a molecule called IP10, which sends T cells to areas of the bottle, body where they are not needed. This may cause the, a chaotic signal, signaling in the body. It's like Usain Bolt hearing the starting gun and starting to run, referring to the Olympic sprinter. Then someone keeps firing the starting gun. What would he do? He'd stop and be confused. And the result is that the body may be signaling T cells almost at random here in COVID, confusing the immune response. Many T cells apparently die, and so the body's reserves are depleted, particularly in those over the age of 40, in whom the T gland, the thymus gland, the organ that generates new T cells, has become less efficient. Wow, that was a lot. Okay, let's do some Q&A stuff. All right. Alana, so, you, st you still alive out there? Yes, we have a lot of questions. So one of the questions is, does COVID-19 mutate too fast to develop a vaccine? If not, what makes developing a vaccine so difficult? Um, the answer is, there, it, the first answer is that it's clear that COVID is mutating. What we do not know at this point is whether it's mutating away from a vaccine candidate. Viruses mutate, that is the norm. Uh, the, we do not know at this time if it is mut mutating away from a vaccine candidate. There are at least 130 different vaccine candidates uh, that are being developed right now. Uh, what was the second half? Uh, Yes. The second half of that question, Ilana. It says, if not, what makes developing a vaccine so difficult? Yeah, we don't know if our body's immune system, whether the uh, T cells, B cells, uh, can be trained to kill a virus that enters your nose. I mean, if the virus is hitting the receptor 
contacting the, the receptor first that unless there was say some antibody in your mucus in your snot that could actually kill the virus before it could bind with a receptor it might be that we can't stop the virus from getting into the body so we just simply don't know yet good question next question okay the next question is is will people who recover from covid19 ever recover or will they have health problems for the rest of their lives uh, that's a great question the answer is there's sort of four types of people that get COVID. Um, there are folks that don't have any symptoms at all. There are folks that get some mild symptoms. There are folks that get some pretty crap, crappy symptoms. They get a bad cough and sick and fever and feel absolutely horrible and maybe end up in the hospital. And they're the folks that get critically ill and who may die. Now, of the folks that get critically ill, there may be permanent damage to the lungs. Indeed, as you may have seen in the news, there was a 20 year old girl that had a double lung trans transplant due to, the, due to COVID recently, due to COVID's lung damage. Uh, there seems to be some evidence of a post COVID symptom in people who don't necessarily get all that terribly sick. Um, it seems that most folks probably either don't have symptoms or they get it and they get over it without post COVID symptoms. Next question. Okay, the next question is, is how does COVID cause blood clotting? Is this common in young COVID-19 patients? Ab absolutely is common in, uh, in uh, young COVID-19 patients. Um, it causes blood clotting through an activation of the immune system that results in the activation of the clotting pathway. The clotting pathway is an upside down Y that looks like that. And whereas in the old days, when I was a kid 40 years ago, we thought, well, 45 years ago, we thought that it was a very simple pathway. We know that now, that now the clotting system of the body is inherently tied to the immune system so that stimulating the immune system can stimulate, stimulate the clotting pathway. Okay. Another question is, are face shields as effective as masks to, pre to prevent exposure? or are masks better as they are completely, as they completely cover the nose? Neither are, neither are uh, ideally effective. Excuse me, let me rephrase that sentence. Neither are 100% effective. Uh, I would not approach a patient without a mask on. I wear glasses and so that kind of helps with some goggles. Uh, it is best to have both. Um, and uh, there was a, a, my own hospital yesterday passed a rule that if I'm going to see a patient, I now have to have a face shield in addition to a mask. <clears throat> but please folks, don't go out without wearing a mask. Next question. Let's take two more. Okay, is there a difference in benefit to patients between IV vitamin C versus oral vitamin C? That's a great question. The answer we probably don't know for sure. My, own, my oldest brother actually did <clears throat> some of the viral C, uh, vitamin C research uh, for the treatment of sepsis at the Medical College of Virginia. Um, it, it appears that what vitamin C does is that it ameliorates um, the, um, uh, it ameliorates the, this immune stimulation effect. I'm gonna show you a response to that in just a moment that says that oral vitamin C may be protective also. However, I'll show that in one of the next slides. Next, last question. Okay, the last one is, what are some unknown ways people can improve their immune systems? Let me, I have a slide on that. So I will, I'll take a slide on that, okay? okay. So let's move. <clears throat> the World Health, Health Organization, recently apparently defunded by the United States of America, the World Health Organization, <clears throat> you may know was the world organization that came together and in 1980 was able to eradicate one of the great horrible human scourges namely smallpox from the face of the planet except in a uh, except in a test tube in the cdc in atlanta and apparently in russia um, <clears throat> world health organization is seriously researching this um this outbreak and they go on to mention i'll just cover this part that it's interesting that COVID cases appear to be less in countries where they're using BCG vaccine against tuberculosis. Uh, so there may be some innate immune simulation uh, uh, a fighting effect. Um, there are viral treatments that are coming along uh, using gene therapy, uh, possibly like CRISPR to help fight uh, COVID. Remdesivir we've mentioned and acalabrutinib we've mentioned also. Um, 
Now, folks, please be cautious about just reading any old thing on the internet or on a newspaper and assuming that that is fact, because that is not so. Trying to do science by press release without backing it up, either with a traditional medical journal, has universally led to misunderstanding and has no place in science. <clears throat> now, this is where I get into the answer to that question. This is from the Eastern Virginia Medical School put out a few days ago, <clears throat> which is their, their critical care COVID management protocol, including how to prevent it. They talk about the fact that you will see during the severity of the illness here, viral replication occurring, innate immunity, followed by uh, lower clotting factors, followed by immune dysregulation, macrophage activated syndrome, and cytokine storm that occurs over a period of days with these various worsening symptoms, beginning with fever, uh, feeling crummy, uh, headache, cough, diarrhea, followed by shortness of breath, and then the, 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 the developing of injured organs followed by progressive hypoxia and so forth. And then it talks about various therapies that we'll cover on the next slides. This gets into the answer to that question that they asked Elana. Prophylaxis means prevention. While there is limited data, the following cocktail may have a role in prevention of COVID. This is cheap and safe and widely available. What I would tell you about is vitamin C, which is oral, which, and I take it every day, which in fact may prevent the cytokine stimulation later in part. There's not hard science on this. We will ignore the quercetin for a moment. Zinc supplementation apparently inhibits the activation of NF-kappa B, inhibiting the leading to the cytokine storm. I take 15 milligrams a day, they say 75. Uh, one of the infectious disease experts who helped, he named the Gulf War syndrome in America and he helped chase Ebola out of our community here in Dallas, told me that he personally does this and so if, if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me, I'm taking it. You can get it over the counter at the drugstore or you can buy it online. Melatonin inhibits the cytokine storm. I take it every day, five milligrams. They suggest beginning with 0.3 is tolerated to two at night. I take five, that's what I take every night. I sleep like a rock and it makes me feel a little better. And then vitamin D3 supplementation, some in the range of 1,000 to 4,000 units per day. Pomodidine is Pepsid, good old stomach medicine that you see over the counter. Pomodidine appears to have antiviral replication properties. This is all for prophylaxis. I take vitamin C, zinc, melatonin, vitamin D, and famotidine. I do it. So think about it. Um, if patients become symptoms, they talk about continuing the same things, possibly adding an aspirin, but then monitoring themselves with pulse oximetry. Uh, and if it looks like the person's getting a low pulse oximetry, that they need to be seen by medical evaluation soon. Obviously, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine and azithromycin at this time are not recommended. So the patients have become mildly symptomatic in the hospital. They will add in, including some steroids. Uh, they may consider adding remdesivir early, even to the patients that are mildly asymptomatic. We will have more data on this soon to where an early antiviral makes a difference. Ivermectin is a medicine, believe it or not, for treating worms in uh, animals and humans. Yes, I said worms, but it actually has uh, a property that I've looked at and studied about. I don't take it personally, but it, it actually has, it, it, it blocks the binding of a carrier protein in the cytosol of the cells to pre prevent the viral binding protein and the viral particle from being transmitted into the nucleus of the cell. That's what it does. And so they think that that's important. Obviously the addition of oxygen and so forth. And then if the patients get quite sick, they would add steroids, vitamin C, IV, full anticoagulation to prevent clots going to the lungs and other organs. And a falling oxygen level um, should be a trigger to start anti-inflammatory treatment. And then finally, it looks like this. Deterioration, low flow oxygen, high flow oxygen, invasive mechanical ventilation, prone positioning face down, and then ultimately bypassing the lungs themselves through extra corporeal membrane oxygenation, which is called ECMO. Folks, this thing is real. This is happening now. This is the death rate as of a couple of days ago uh, in the United States and in Dallas County. I'm sorry, this is Dallas County here. So this is occurring. 
we've got to watch this very, very carefully because this is, uh, this is happening. Now, these are local reports. I'm getting to wrap up. These are local reports. These are where we actually watch our regional data, which is the North Texas region. So what I'm about to short show you is what is happening in Texas in the North Texas region, including Dar uh, Dallas County, Tarrant County, which is Fort Worth and so forth. So what I want to show you is if you look back about a month, the blue line are the med surge admits for COVID patients. And if you will see that this blue line just gradually goes up like this. And so there's the gradual trend. These are weekends, by the way, and there's less reporting on weekends that we're seeing a steady increase of patients with COVID being admitted to the hospital. This is ICU beds occupied. This is as of uh, two days ago, the number of beds in the hospital that were number of ICU beds that were occupied in the region. And these were the available beds in the region for ICU patients. You can extrapolate it over here and you can see that there were about 14, about 1,450 beds occupied with about 2,500 beds, roughly 2,400 beds available if you use that number here. And so we have some capacity, but we have a lot of patients in the ICU. This is the total hospital bed capacity. This is every hospital bed in the entire region. This is about 15,500 beds in the region, of which uh, about 1,050 are occupied. So you can see that about a third, of, excuse me, two thirds of all the beds in our hospital, in, a, in all the hospitals in our region are occupied. And then finally, these are the confirmed COVID patients in the hospitals through day before yesterday. And you can see a steady trend of admission of patients to the hospital. People do not get in the hospital with COVID unless they are sick. It may be multiple problems. <clears throat> a guy came in, a patient may come in with congestive heart failure. And in fact, that uh, he also happens to be COVID positive with his congestive heart failure as well. This is from yesterday. Parkland, my, my and Brandon's hospital yesterday had 125 patients in the hospital with COVID. That number today, I, did, I didn't put today's slide in, is 135 patients. We've had 10 more. This is inpatients in the hospital. And the total patients at Clemens Hospital uh, was 36. It's the same number today. So we've got something in the range between the two hospitals of 170 inpatients with COVID. This is a lot of sick people. This is the Garland Fire Department, which who, with whom I reach, and you'll notice that we're seeing a steady stream of patients with respiratory symptoms that are being transported by EMS. This is the San Antonio Fire Department through about five days ago, San Antonio, Texas. And you'll see that calls for COVID suspected patients by the ambulance, for the ambulance service, continues to go up. And then this uh, is a very interesting study in which they said, is there a way of being able to estimate how many COVID patients there, excuse me, how many people in the community are infected with COVID virus? Is there some novel way? Well, what if we took a sample of the sewage of communities, since COVID appears to show up in people's urine and feces, couldn't we just sample the sewage from certain areas to say, are we seeing COVID in this community? Are we seeing COVID in this community? And in fact, this is an effort uh, to, uh, to uh, show what was happening in Miami-Dade. Again, the slide, ladies and gentlemen, is the fact that if we, will, if we do not wear masks, the number of cases are going to go up. If we do wear masks, the number of deaths are, will hopefully level off and not continue to rise. Uh, if, we will, if we don't wear our masks, um, but rather if we ease and people go outdoors without wearing their masks, the daily deaths will continue to rise. If we do wear our masks, we can protect ourselves. Uh, this is an outbreak of coronavirus that occurred in dozens of patients that occurred in a, in a Michigan college bar. Coronavirus pandemic is leading to a surge in Alzheimer's deaths from all kinds of reasons, including the fact that we can't get care to our patients, we're seeing spikes of deaths in nursing homes because these people are much more frail. Um, um, global death total tops 500,000 and the U.S. test sites are overwhelmed as the coronavirus cases pass 10 million. And finally, y'all, I'm about to wrap up in about five minutes. Please listen. I know you're tired. I don't know whether there's 670 of you souls still out there. Listen to this. This is about you. 
you're thinking about going to medical school. Okay, there's a whole bunch of people on this call who are out on the front line. I would dare say many of you also are on the front line who are taking care of patients or we're taking care of patients and we're faced with this all the time. Folks, I'm 67. I'm one of the folks that dies of this stuff. I hope to God that I don't. I'm taking my zinc and my melatonin and my famotidine and so on. Um, and I'm being very careful. I'm wearing a mask. I'm washing my hands 10 times an hour and I'm trying not to do stupid stuff. But we're facing in medicine a mental health crisis amid this coronavirus. Coronavirus may become endemic, meaning it's not going to go away. It might. Can medicine overcome this culture of, well, I'm tough, just suck it up and go take care of the patients and shut up? Well, what does that result in? Over 60,000 healthcare workers contracted COVID. At least 300 have died of COVID. An estimated 300 to 400 physicians die of suicide every year. Already COVID tests seem to be, for medical workers, seem to be exceeding the healthcare workers that um, uh, commit suicide per year. And this was from China's data that showed that half of healthcare workers were terrified of what was going to happen. I don't want this stuff. Most folks don't get too sick if they get sick with it at all. We've had a number of our residents um, who uh, are not, who have gotten ill, but we're not all that terribly ill. I personally am being tested. This, it's a study called the Covered Study in which 40 of our faculty at Southwestern are being tested every two weeks, soon to be every, excuse me, soon to be every four weeks, blood and nose culture as well. I need to point out I've been tested twice and I'm negative for both which means apparently I have not had an exposure significant enough to infect my immune system. But folks, you have to think about this, is that the thing is, is that we have, we have to think about who we are and our own mental health and how to care for ourselves so that we don't become ill, so that we don't make our family members ill, so that we don't then hurt somebody in our family or our friends, or transmit this disease, we have to use good sense. Physicians are already often beaten down and burned out. The burned out term is suffering from moral injury. Focus, I'm about to stop. Listen to what I just said. Uh, and Reagan Rosenberger, whom you've met, is one of the working group, and I published about this. Reagan was first author on a paper, paper about moral injury in EMS professionals, burnout. This, as many as 60% of physicians say today that they feel this sense of moral injury in their work, burnout being the reaction of normal people to a toxic situation. What more toxic than you could catch this stuff and die? Now, focus. It appears that PPE works. Listen to what I said. We don't have to be martyrs. Focus, and one more time, please be patient with me about being your shadower physician tonight. Listen to this. You can protect yourself. It appears that you can protect yourself. It appears that the principal way to not catch this disease is to keep stuff out of your nose. I know that sounds stupid. I have just presented to you the current science on this disease all the way down to the innate immune system. I can't help you unless you keep stuff out of your nose so that you don't transmit it to your family, possibly injure or something terrible to your parents or your grandparents and so forth. Keep stuff out of your nose. How do you do that? Put a mask on so that we can be physicians and we do not have to be martyrs. Ladies and gentlemen, it appears, and this is just from a few hours ago, that there is now a new influenza virus that is emerging in China right now. You say, yet another virus from China? Yes, there is a new influenza virus, a new H1N1, that apparently binds well to the human respiratory epithelium, replicates efficiently in the human respiratory epithelium, transmits in animals easily, causes severe disease, that there is no cross-reaction to the current flu vaccines, and is easily apparently transmittable from humans from animals to humans 
What we don't yet know is if it transfers from humans to humans yet. Stay tuned. This may be a new flu on top of the COVID epidemic. Do you still think you want to go into medicine? I hope you do, because you can take care of yourself. You can make a difference. Uh, we did. I'm sorry about that slide. We can take care of ourselves, and we can bind together the wounds that afflict us all from time to time so we can live in the betterment of service to our fellow humans. You're around a carrier um, and you wear your mask, then you can decrease the chance of infection to yourself. You put the mask on the carrier and the chance of contagion is much less. You put a mask on a carrier and you wear a mask and there is much, much less chance. That was a lot. I'm sorry this went so long. It was an hour and a half. God bless you poor people. And uh, still 667. I mentioned Mike Osterholm's book, Deadliest Enemy. I'm a believer. I read it. I strongly recommend it. He's an excellent writer about this epidemic. Uh, I also recommend John Barry's book, The Great Influenza. It's the story of what happened in 1918. Uh, Barry is a riveting writer and it reads like a detective novel. And if you're going to be in the business of taking care of people and epidemics, it's something that you ought to be aware of. Aldous Huxley said, love casts out fear, but conversely, fear casts out love. And not only love, fear also casts out intelligence, casts out goodness, casts out all thought of beauty and truth. Let's don't be afraid. Let's do the right thing. Let's take care of each other. We talked about a new disease. Watch the progress. It ain't over yet. Wash your hands, folks. Wear your mask. Take care of everybody else. Um, Ilana, I know that we had three questions that were posed uh, that I went ahead and put in here. Um, and I, I'd like to take these, if that's okay. Um, how do you believe COVID has strengthened my ability as a health care provider? I'm wearing a mask and washing my hands as I've never done before. I'm cleaning my instruments that I carry in my white coat as I've never done before. Uh, I'm much more respectful of potential transmission within the, my environment. Um, um, I miss one thing, and as people who've shadowed me know, I love sitting at the bedside and, and holding the patient's hands and talking to them. I mean, we're not doing that right now. We just, we can't. So there's some things that I, I wish I could get back. Mm -hmm. What can students be doing to the, help the frontline workers? Don't be a source of infection. Wear your mask, wash your hands, educate other people. Uh, download these slides and share them with others. Um, uh, help folks to help themselves. Uh, be a strong advocate for healthcare frontline workers in whatever ways that you can. You can do that in part by helping sharing the message. I shared on Facebook today this thing that happened in Dallas was there was this lady went to a grocery store and this was caught on video where she gets to the checkout line. It happened to be a lady gets to the checkout line, takes her mask off. She is reminded to put her mask on back on. She won't do it. She throws a tantrum, proceeds to throw out onto the floor and goes stomping out of the store all because she refused to wear a mask. And you go, really? <clears throat> Will the medical school curriculum change? I don't think the curriculum is going to change. Certainly, and of course, the predominant amount of lectures in the first two years are online, virtual anyway. Um, students are going back into the program. The number of deaths has gone down. The, the chief issue, and I'll, I'll stop with this, Elana, the chief issue is that if we can keep COVID from killing anybody, which means get the death rate to zero, then the emergency has gone away. So perhaps a calabrutinib or remdesivir or the next antiviral or melatonin plus famotidine and so forth. So um, I, don't, I don't anticipate a curriculum change per se. Um, and we'll come back to this one. Let's keep, um, um, Oh, well, let me go ahead and cover this. Reagan, are you out there? You, got, you still got a pulse? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> why don't you cover this, and then we'll go back and finish. We'll take about 10 more minutes of questions. Uh, this is your slide. Um, so just to get this, all the quiz questions out of the way, 
Uh, the assessment is open, so you can go to questbase.com and enter this PIN. Uh, make sure to use the dashes, otherwise it won't pull up. Uh, and make sure to put it in that little box. You don't need to sign in, you don't need an account, just make sure to fill in that PIN in the find the, assessment box. The find assessment box, because yes. I, I keep getting emails about that. So you go to Questbase, and this comes up, and you go to find assessment. <clears throat> And you put that in, including with dashes. With dashes. Okay. Uh, and it's COVID-19 password with a dash? Yeah. All caps. Uh, and then the passing score is a 70. This quiz is a little bit longer. It's 16 questions instead of 10. And in order to get the certificate, we're not emailing those out anymore. You have to download it yourself on the result page once you pass. If you don't pass, you can retake it, but you won't get a certificate until then. Uh, so please make sure to download it. We got a few emails last time. Just remember to do that because we're not sending them via email. And then also, if you didn't get this information or we pull away from the slide before you can write down the pin, all of this information is on our Instagram highlights. So check that out. Any other questions for Reagan about this? Hearing none. Um, so we will do 10 more minutes. I mean, there's still 650 of you poor souls still sitting out there. So uh, anybody who wants to leave, go ahead and leave, and we will go ahead and take about 10 more minutes, 15 minutes of questions. And Brandon Morchetti, if you're out there, you had a pulse, you feel free and speak up also. So um, next question, Alana. Okay, we have a lot of questions. So one of them is, can asystematic patients transmit COVID-19? Absolutely. That, that appears to be the principal method of transmission. For example, y'all focus, I know this, 595 of you left, focus. The term is called super spreader. There are apparently people who eliminate more virus or excrete more virus via the respiratory tract. We don't know why yet. I was studying that up until this afternoon, preparing for this talk. It turns out that the perhaps most of the virus transmission occurs in super spreaders in area where areas where people's faces are not covered and nobody knows who the super spreaders are. That's what happened to that bar, that picture I showed you. And so um, it, um, I hope that answered the question, but yes, they're asymptomatic people can most certainly spread. Next question. How does blood type affect likelihood of catching COVID-19? Excellent question. Type A, much more susceptible. We don't know why. 40% 40, 40 more susceptible. Now in the grand scheme of susceptibility, that's a, that's a on the grand scheme of susceptibility, that's a tiny amount, but type A may be as much as 40% more susceptible. Okay. How has the pandemic impacted blood transfusions and organ transplants? That's a great question. Brandon, speak up if you're out there. Um, I am sure that the, I have read as, a, as late as a few weeks ago about concern that COVID may be in the blood uh, in the blood pool, in, in the pool of donated blood. That was the case with HIV in the 1980s. Indeed, one of the great tennis players in history, Arthur Ashe, uh, after he retired, he had, a heart, he had heart surgery and got a blood transfusion during heart surgery and caught HIV, ultimately AIDS, and died of AIDS. And that was before antivirals were available. Uh, I have not heard anything in the recent past. Brandon, speak up. Have you heard anything about um, uh, COVID? In yeah, the blood, um, blood pool. So blood banks are depleted in their uh, reserves right now, not so much because of the, the blood itself being tainted, but because uh, the lack of blood drives. Uh, there's no more gathering and, and doing blood drives. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm giving blood products just the same as I always have and not having to do any other unique testing to get it. Um, and as far as organ transplant, I haven't heard of um, anything outside of routine testing that they're doing for patients before they uh, become a donor. I'm not aware, for example, I am not personally aware of, for example, a tissue test looking for COVID in tissue. And, and well, and we, you would hope that with an antiviral anyway, that there, if there were transmission, that there would be some way of blocking the transmission. When when we, and I think we will, because we did with HIV, HIV was a tenacious disease, but we got antivirals that, we don't have a vaccine for HIV, but we got antivirals. 
uh, I think we're going to see antivirals. We've, we've already got remdesivir. Um, so anyway, uh, Alana, next question. Okay. Um, how likely is contact surface spreading uh, spread for uh, COVID-19? The answer uh, that has the answer has changed, and the most recent answer appears to be much less so than we thought. So this thing of going out, getting in the mail, and coming back and bleaching every envelope and package appears to be not necessary to do, though still use good sense. The predominant method of transmission by far is stuff getting into your nose and into your mouth. Okay. Why does COVID stay dormant for a period of time? Why doesn't it attack our immune systems right away? It appears to attack our immune systems pretty quickly. Um, I mean, if you're going to have it, you're, if you're going to get it, you're going to, I mean, if you're exposed to it and it gets in your bloodstream, sufficient to be able to cause a sufficient viral amount in your body that will allow it to replicate as opposed to be killed off or just go away. It's, it happens within a few days. That's why the quarantine period is 14 days. I think that answers that question. Okay. Next question. Can we see enough monoclonal antibody doses ready for public use this fall? Um, there'll be two types of monoclonal antibody, which is um, donated and synthetic. Um, and, uh, and so the predominant way of getting a monoclonal will be pr presumably synthetic. You hope that what the antibody is going to do is going to go attack free virus that be in the bloodstream, possibly get into your mucus and be available outside so that virus would bind and so forth. I think that there's more work to be done. I, I think we don't know enough yet about how effective monoclonal antibodies again, but do pay attention. The death rate appears to be coming down. We were seeing over 2000 a day. Now we're seeing five, 600 a day. And so, we're doing some things right, it appears, about how we're treating people. Next question. How many days do you recommend people self-isolate in order to prevent the spread of the disease? You, you've crossed over terms. There are two terms, quarantine and isolation. Let's talk about those. Quarantine is when someone may be exposed that they go and get away from other people who may be susceptible for a period that is recommended. In the case of COVID, it's 14 days. If you've been exposed and there is a chance that you could go expose other people, for example, a nursing home, 14 days is the quarantine. Isolation is the other term. Isolation is what you do with someone who has the disease, who is known to be sick. For example, when we have someone with really serious pneumonia that we suspect is contagious, we will isolate them and keep them away from other people. You quarantine the exposed, you isolate the ill. Next question. Okay, um, here's one. How has telemedicine affected patient care? I think for the good. Um, you know, you all have smartphones, except me. I'll show you my flip phone again if you wanna see it. Um, and we all know that just through this session, just like this, that, you know, I can see you, I can hear you, I don't need to smell you or taste you or touch you. Uh, a lot of what we do in medicine, we don't really have to be in person. You can show me a rash, for example, on, you know, by a video screen. Uh, we can do much, we can do all of the history taking from a patient, you know, from a remote location. Um, and so the amount uh, uh, of actual up close and personal contact is much less. I will say this about our own university here, uh, UT Southwestern, our university here, is the third most quoted research institution in the world, I have been told. Um, a month ago, we were doing a handful of telemedicine visits in this big university per month. Uh, I was told that we were doing over a thousand telemedicine visits a week as of about a month ago. So it has radically changed the way that we're doing medicine on this university campus. Next question. When Texas and similar states were beginning to reopen, were you expecting cases to rise as much as they have? Absolutely. I think what we've learned, I, I you know, what do I know? I mean, I've, I've been around a long time and I, I thought, I said, if, they, if this thing appears to be as contagious as it apparently is, we're gonna see increases. And sure enough, we have. Uh, what I think 
that we didn't expect so much, so much is that the predominant way of spreading it appears to be getting stuff into your nose and mouth that so many people would go outside without a mask, go hang out in bars, breathe on each other. Uh, I live in an apartment with a pool right out the window right here. And this past Saturday, there were 40 people out by the pool and all sitting around in groups having their drinks and you know, minding their own business, but nobody had a mask on, nobody. Well, I get that. They were out by the pool, but there was you know, six and a dozen people breathing on each other. This is how you spread it. Uh, next question. How would providers ration ventilators and treatments at clinics or hospitals if it came down to needing to do that? That's a great question. Uh, Brandon, did you hear that question? You want to try it? How we would ration ventilators? Are you still out there? Yeah, I am. I'm sorry, I was would, answering another question in the chat there. Um, how would we ration ventilators in the hospital if it came to that? Uh, well, luckily we work in a place that has a, a pretty good supply of ventilators. I think we're running at about 70% um, capacity right now. But if it came down to it, you get ventilators if you need them. Um, I think we've learned a lot over the last two months that we're not actually having to intubate near as many patients as we did uh, at the beginning of this pandemic. And these patients are actually... Uh, you know, our death rates are going down. So maybe we did them no favors by intubating before that may be helping to ration the ventilators. But if it comes down to it and we've only got one ventilator left and I've got two or three patients that need one, um, then that's a tough call to make as a physician. And that's when, um, you know, you have to weigh all the pros and cons, risks and benefits, family discussions. Um, and those are the choices that they don't teach you in medical school. Um isn't this what medical students are made for to sit to stand at the patient's bedside with full PPE on and bag the patient nice and slowly at a certain rate that that becomes their job? There was a uh, there was a great physician that trained here and came back to give talks. He um, did a lot of time in India um, taking care of kind of some pretty rural hospitals where he was one hospital for hundreds of miles in another direction. And he told us stories about um, a lot of organophosphate poisonings, a lot of patients being intubated and very few ventilators. And so the families of the patient would take turns and shifts, squeezing the bag valve mask breathing for their loved one. And that's how they, they managed uh, in India. And I was just fascinated with a lot of his stories talking about how to do care like that in a resource poor area. Absolutely. Uh, next slide. Next. Listen to me. Last slides there. Uh, Alana, I'm sorry. Next question. I beg your pardon. Okay. Can you get COVID and the flu at the same time? Absolutely. Two different viruses. And that's why that I showed you that last slide about the, the new swine, what appears to be swine emergent flu in China. Um, and so what, what's that word, Brandon, for what, what's the season going to be called in the fall? Fluvid. Fluvid season this fall. That's what it was. Flubolavid. Uh, Flubola? Is that what you said? Flubolavid, yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Next question. Is it possible to get COVID-19 more than once? That's a good question. The answer may be yes, um, because we don't know what the post-infection immunity looks like if there is any. For example, multiple sources, I've read multiple sources on this, suggest that you don't maintain a long lasting immunity to a coronavirus. Therefore, we don't know if vaccines, number one, are gonna work. And number two, if you're gonna maintain immunity, hopefully they will and they will, but we simply don't yet know. And so now I have seen between Brandon and me, uh, we've seen oodles of COVID patients. I, I don't, what percentage you saw you thought had COVID last shift, Brandon? I, when I worked Wednesday, I, it's around uh, 50%. Of, of all the patients you saw, actually, you had COVID? Um, yeah, if you, um, uh, well, about 50% of the patients I see, I'm testing. And then um, my positivity rate is probably somewhere around 20, 25%. In the community that's, that's, right now, it's about 15%. Yeah. Uh, and let's move on to a thought, which is Michael Osterholm, who wrote that book I showed you, uh, said that it won't be until the population at large has 60 to 70 percent herd immunity until the number of infections start going down. 
The question is about that. We just simply don't know yet about herd immunity. We just don't know. Next question. Are there differences in the accuracy of COVID-19 testing based on who offers them? Um, absolutely. There are a bunch of different COVID tests. Um, uh, the one that you saw on the table at the White House in one of the briefings a couple of months ago um, uh, actually has fallen into some less admiration due to its sensitivity being less, meaning the fact that you can give them the swab and it may have virus on it, but the machine won't find it. It's a false negative test. I, I won't get into a bunch of different tests. There are a bunch of different types of machines that are out there. that are some that are exceptionally accurate. There, there are limits to the test though, for example, let's say you do a swab and you only get a few virus particles on it. It may not be enough to show up positive. All right, uh, Elana. Okay. Do recovered patients have permanently damaged lung tissue scarring? No, I, I would say most people probably recover uh, a full recovery. Um, uh, there are some who most certainly have uh, long-term lung damage, which probably is going to resemble something like emphysema, sort of, shortness of breath, maybe more like chronic bronchitis. Uh, but some limitation of lung capacity. So yes, there's gonna be a post-COVID pulmonary syndrome and perhaps other immune syndrome, a chronic fatigue type picture, for example. Next question. What do you think about certain colleges reopening in the fall? Well, you know, I'm not the boss. Um, I think, I, I know that what's going to happen is that if, if the current rate is remaining high, number one. Number two, we know how it's transmitted. That number three, if you put a bunch of people up face to face, that the virus is going to be transmitted. That's going to happen. Well, so uh, American Airlines got pressed today, and I, I usually fly American, that uh, they got criticism today because they're going to fill back up their airplanes. American Airlines retorted to that is the fact that, but we know how to protect people on airplanes now. I guess that may be so. What are they gonna do with someone who refuses to wear a mask, throw them off? Uh, like that lady in the grocery store. Next question. With the better treatment, can we see a difference in approach to this pandemic? Well, you've asked several things. There are already improving treatments. And treatments fall into many things. The, the, the term taking care of the lungs and taking care of the secretions of the lungs is called pulmonary, which means lungs, toilet, which is like toilet, but it's called pulmonary toilet. With improved pulmonary toilet, the management of secretions, actually not using, as I mentioned in the talk and as Brandon mentioned, about not using positive uh, necessarily end expiratory pressure, not treating it at lay ARDS, but instead using the proning position and so forth and so forth. We have gotten better at treating this illness. Um, other treatments may show up like new antivirals. The acalabrutinib, which is, I, I quote that study because it was interesting that when remdesivir showed up, the stock market went up 3000 points. When, when the Akalabrutinib paper was published about six weeks ago, the stock market didn't budge. One's an antiviral, one is an immune modulator. They're, they're both being tested in large studies. So uh, uh, we, we will see continued improved treatments. I don't know that we'll ever see a silver bullet per se. Next question. Okay. What do you think of the new swine flu from China? How could it affect the COVID response if it begins to pick up later this winter? I would invite Brandon to comment on this too. Um, uh, I'm terrified by it. Um, you know, there have been many horrible influenzas, the bird flu. These are viruses that cause rapid pulmonary decline in a day or two, faster than COVID. Um, they would be transmitted predominantly through the same way. So if, if people don't cover up wearing their mask, use good, use good sense and social distancing and so forth, we could see the same thing. Um, there does not appear to be a flu vaccine 
at this time toward that H1N1. Moreover, flu vaccines, folks, typ typically are not 100% protective. We all get them over here at the hospital, but they're only 40 or 50% protective anyway for the flu vaccine. Next question. Can you explain why is is the thromycin and hydrochloroquine does it does not work? Is the thromycin and hydrochloroquine? Well, it, it's because of two reasons. Number one is lack of having effects that are useful. I, when the hydroxychloroquine issue came out, I went out to the literature and read about it. I said, what all does hydroxychloroquine do to cells that help control uh, uh, malaria and lupus? that it might in fact control the virus. For example, uh, we know that viral particles, uh, uh, they come th through a cell membrane, form an endosome in which the virus is floating in, in there, and there's some liquid in there. And that liquid is typically has an acidic pH. And that hydroxychloroquine changes the pH of that liquid to a basic alkaline nature. And so there's some things that it really does. The, correct, the issue is that apparently it doesn't have an effect. And also we know hydroxychloroquine can prolong the <clears throat> cardiac, the heart muscle repolarization cycle, possibly inducing sudden death and so on. <clears throat> we'll take two more questions. We're getting at two hours now, so. Okay. Um, how effective is wearing gloves to help reduce the spread? Well, of course, your gloves can become contaminated, which means you transmit it back to yourself. And so to be candid with you, I would wear a pair of gloves and go do something and then go take them off and wash my hands. That's what I do. It, in that setting, that is the only thing that, to me that where gloves make sense. For example, if you go out wearing gloves and a mask and goggles, of course, but then you have your gloves and you go out and touch something that's contaminated, the fact that you then come in, if you're still wearing the gloves, your hands are contaminated with the gloves on. So just because you're wearing the gloves doesn't mean that you, you don't have to take the gloves off. You've got to get rid of them and then wash your hands. Next slide. Uh, next question. Last. This will be the last question, okay? Does the flu and other coronaviruses also spread through all of the body systems to some extent? Brandon, you can help me on this. And the short answer is best, I'm aware, influenza certainly causes pneumonia, encephalitis, shock, immune system alterations. I don't know about flu and renal, as opposed to COVID and renal. I don't know that influenza. Uh, you can get a myocarditis uh, from influenza, um, heart failure um, also. So there are some differences, but some similarities as well. All right, everybody, for you 342 survivors out there, we really, really, Brandon and I and Alana and the whole team, really appreciate your kindness and your participation. We will have this um, talk posted by sometime early tomorrow. Uh, the exam is up. Please take the exam and get your certificate. Uh, we're available by email. There are hundreds of you, so we have to, um, so we have to obviously try to answer as many as we can. And if you have suggestions about what you would like to hear, then please let us hear from you. And so with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we bid you a good night and thank you all for coming.